Okay. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah? cool. All right. Um, there we go. So yeah, so quick qualification. I do have a consultancy here in New York City, um, but I've been a data guy for uh, 32 years now and been through many, many evolutions of data going from like mainframe to client server to internet, dimensional modding, you know, uh, relational databases and unstructured data. And where we are today, I think to be in this space of digital and data is probably without, without a doubt more disruptive and more exciting than all of the other transitions that were made in the past 30 years. Right now is where it's at. And right now we've even like, we're just touching the tip of the iceberg and, um, and I'm excited to be here and hopefully, hopefully you'll be excited to be here. Also, before we start, I will note that I think right now clocks in about eight hours of this already today. So uh, thank you for hanging in there. Give yourself a round of applause for just being here. That's awesome. <clears throat> and um, and it, just a quick, you know, two, 30 seconds of my company. So we do business intelligence, data intelligence, artificial intelligence um, from a uh, functional capabilities perspective for your business. And then we're also technologists. So we will come up with data architecture, data engineering, and data science. We cover all spans of different um, domains. Um, we're based in New York City, so we do a lot of financial services, but a lot of entertainment um, all across the spectrum, insurance. And we're going to talk a little bit about how some of the advances that's going on today are affecting all of these different domains. Um, just a quick little survey. I don't know if any, if any, you already did this, I apologize, but I would like to see, I could like talk as deep or as high as you want, but uh, I'd like to know who here is on the cloud already? Who here is going to be on the cloud either by the end of 2018 or by the t end of 2019? Okay. Who here is doing artificial intelligence already? Three hands. Wow. A four. Okay. Who here plans on doing artificial intelligence by the end of 2018 or 2019? Only one more hand. Okay. Um, well, let me tell you why we're here. Um, we are strategically partnered with m all of the cloud providers, uh, Google Cloud, Amazon Cloud, uh, Microsoft Cloud, IBM Cloud. Um, what I'm gonna talk about today doesn't really matter um, as far as like which vendor, which cloud provider, it's all applicable. We've done migrations of taking companies from on-prem solutions to being on the cloud, really specifically to be more strategically um, competitive. And um, we are actually doing a New York City-based meetup in, um, on June 20th with the New York Times. So we actually helped the New York Times shut down their on-prem data center. Um, we migrated them 100% to Google Cloud, and they're doing some really advanced analytics and functional capabilities for the business that they weren't able to do before when they had on-prem solutions. So that's gonna be at Galvanize on, um, on June 20th. If you're interested in that, it's gonna be really, really cool. New York Times themselves are gonna present and, um, and that is, uh, you can go to meetup.com and search big data warehousing and that's our group. We have about 5,000 members in New York City. So it's, um, we expect to have about 200, 250 people coming. Anybody here from uh, Bank of America? Okay, Bank of America, it's your fault. It's your fault that I was up at 2.14 a.m. Um, receiving this email, making me think, this is what I need to talk about when I come do this talk. So this is, I think, why we're all here. This is why I'm here. And this is where I am directing my business. I am all in on what we're looking at right now. And apparently so is Bank of America. So what this is, is this is pivoting their business or pivoting a business to go from very legacy traditional thinking to becoming a artificial intelligence driven organization to better serve your customers. In a nutshell, that's what this is, right? And this is, you know, 
most of the companies that we are dealing with here, this is why that they're doing, this is what they're doing. And you know, maybe it's not a virtual assistant, but it's some form of artificial intelligence to help give their customers a better experience. So we're gonna talk about exactly what that looks like. And I do wanna talk, oops, that didn't work. Let's see, can we get a play? There we go. Anybody know what this is? The clownfish, and where is the clownfish swimming in? An enemies, awesome. Who said that, raise your hand, awesome. So yeah, so as one of my hobbies, I actually am raising a reef aquarium in my living room. And one of the really great uh, symbiotic relationships of this earth is the clownfish and the anemone. And I think of this with artificial intelligence and human beings, right? Theoretically, right, there's lots of fear, not theoretically, in reality, there's lots of fear between, you know, is artificial intelligence gonna take my job? And should I be afraid of artificial intelligence becoming smarter than me? And it's clearly a symbiotic relationship, right? Here, you know, clownfish should eat the anemone, and the anemone should sting and poison the clownfish. But they decided over evolution that they are, when they are in a relationship, they're actually both stronger and they both survive longer. And I think it's a really good analogy of how we should be treating artificial intelligence, right? Um, the anemone protects the clownfish from the larger fish, and the clownfish actually feeds, we won't get into how they feed it because it's a little gross, but they actually give the anemone nutrients, right, um, to survive. So we wanna talk about embracing rather than resisting artificial intelligence. So that the two, you know, especially the thing we care about most, which is humans, so we can survive longer, right? And we can actually have better lives and safer lives. So this guy, Chris Danzi, took the ideas that, you know, that a lot of companies are doing and just multiplied it by 700. And the reason I say that is, who here is wearing a Fitbit? Anybody? A couple people? Who here is like using your phone to do things like measure your steps or measure activities? Right? A lot more people, right? Um, this guy took 700 different devices and put them all over his body. And he is capturing everything you could ever possibly measure. And so what he says, and I really believe in this wholeheartedly, he said, I'm not generating any new data. All of this data always existed, right? It's like measuring light, right? Light is just air that happens to be brighter than the air in the darkness. And now we have machines that can measure like lumens, right? So we know exactly how light it is or exactly how dark it is. He thinks that he says it's basically the same thing, right? The fact that we're taking steps, the fact that we're moving, the fact that we're heart is racing, right? All of those things always happened. The only thing that changed between before and now is now we have the ability to capture that data, harness that data, and now do analytics on that data. So using that, right, capturing that what was before invisible data, which is now visible to us, now actually taking it and using it to our advantage to improve our lives. Make sense? Michio Kakao, New Yorker, right? Uh, theoretical physicist, one of the brightest men in the world. Um, he says artificial intelligence today is about as intelligent as cockroach. Right? This is where you're supposed to laugh. So, <laughs> thank you. On cue. Um, so, you know, we do artificial intelligence solutions with our company. So, we, we like to pride ourselves on our artificial intelligence solutions are at least as smart as like a normal cockroach. Um, that's where you're supposed to laugh again. Um, but the, um, you know, what he says is, you know, we're just at like the tip, like as smart as machines are, as smart as this Alexis uh, um, Erica is, we're just like, we're just barely scratching the surface of the full capabilities of artificial intelligence, right? So, you know, and he, he, and he equates it to just another step of the industrial revolution, 
right? The, there are four steps of the Industrial Revolution. One is when, when steam was invented in the 18th century, how they started to use steam to, to help with manufacturing. People were afraid that steam was going to replace their jobs. As it turns out, that steam actually created more product, so you can actually create more business. Um, then we invented electricity in the, turn, in the 19th century. Again, starting to automate manufacturing, building assembly lines. And then in the 70s, we started imp, uh, complementing electri electrical mechanical parts with IT. So now we can have programmable um, assembly lines, right? And now, and automation. And now we have artificial intelligence, right? Artificial intelligence combined with robotics, right, is, is the next natural progression. And a lot of people say, well, you know, artificial intelligence and robotics is gonna replace our jobs. So did all of the other things, but we're all still here and we're all still working, right? And I do think it's part of an evolution. And with any evolution, you have to adapt to change or die off, right? And I think the people who adapt to change are the people who are gonna be the survivors. And the people who are in front of the change are gonna be the real winners. So, you know, what is this, how are we doing on time? There's no timer up here, is there? Um, so, AI for the people um, means that what's in it for us? Like how, do we really think that it's going to improve our lives? And we looked at Erica, we use how many Alexa or Siri users in the room, right? And why do we do that? Why do we do that? Shout out, why, anybody, why do you do that? What's that? Convenient. It's convenient, right. It makes our life at least a little bit more efficient, right? We can do something easier than we were able to do it before. And that's just as AI starts, matures, things are gonna get even easier to the point where we're going to think about you know, all of the mundane things that we do, like make appointments and, you know, schedule reservations and restaurants and like doctor's appointments and all of that, will start to become something that we don't have to think about anymore. We can just have our virtual assistant do that for us, which we'll probably call a virtual assistant at the restaurant and we'll have machines talking to machines, uh, you know, establishing our lifestyle for the humans, right? Pretty exciting. Whoops, where'd we go? So we do wanna start embracing change and we still wanna think about what are the possibilities of, like if we can train these machines. I personally think, and this is sure gonna be debated, hopefully you guys can, we can talk about it at the cocktail party later, but um, I think the medical industry, if we think about what, the way the medical industry works today, I know I had a, uh, a growth on my leg and it turned out to be benign keratosis, which is nothing. It's like just a sign of old age. But, um, but you know, basically how, what did I do? I went to my local doctor, some guy who was trained in a school, had his own life experience and based on his own individual life experience, he came to a conclusion, right? And luckily it was nothing. What if it was something? Right, uh, here I am, like he just happened to be the guy in my neighborhood, right? That's how I selected him. And, uh, and he, you know, he had his own, maybe a group of people if something was really complicated and he didn't know the answer, he'd ask one or two other people in his group. But wouldn't it be cool if we actually leverage technology that already exists and data that already exists, which is every case of this, of this little tumor that ever existed, and what were the symptoms, and what was the outcome, right? And, and if it was even more complicated than that, right, using artificial intelligence to figure out what the outcome might be based on my situation, based on my own DNA, right, which is also known, right? And, you know, and the, the fact that we're limiting our life on conventional wisdom of other people, rather than leveraging the world's information and artificial intelligence, I see, you know, natural progression is that's gonna shift and we're gonna start seeing a change in that. And all of that depends on data, right? Without data, none of this would exist. You can have the greatest algorithms in the world. If you can't feed it its food, 
right? It's not going to predict anything. It's not going to survive, right? So data is where it's at. You know, someone said earlier, data is the new oil. Um, I think data is a, the new food, right? Without it, we eventually, we won't be able to get to do the things that we like to do, like survive. Um, so data is important, uh, especially within organizations. So having a very, very methodical, standardized way of dealing with your data is more important than ever. There's more data than we ever had. There's different types of data we ever had. Um, you know, in financial institutions, in that earlier slide with all the logos, you know, right now, we're a fairly small company. We're doing four new implementations where we're doing artificial intelligence on alternative data. Somebody was talking about it earlier. You know, doing things like the, the poster child for alternative data is satellite images of parking lots and writing algorithms to count the cars to try to predict, predict sales right, of, of a store, right? So doing things like that, without, without having an environment where you can do that, where you have methodical, standardized ways of ingesting, collecting, cleaning, conforming, consolidating, enriching data, and then having governance associated to it, and building ephemeral data science workspaces so that you can have a theory, very quickly spin up a, a laboratory, test your theory, and if it works, put it in production. If it doesn't, clean the room and start all over with something else, right? That is the way that we need to be able to start doing our business. And that's really the way 100% um, of our clients are doing their business today. And then ultimately at the top, you'll, we'll just mention the big data warehouse. So this is you know, fully scalable, fully governed, fully trusted, send your reports to Wall Street type in, of environment. And this is probably way too technical for this class. This is on Google Cloud. This is what the environment looks like. We'll just skip over that. And, but one thing when we move to the cloud, the thing that always comes up is I can't move my cloud. I can't move my data to the cloud. It's like it's not secure on the cloud. It's much safer on-prem. If you really think of cybersecurity and GDPR and what it really means to protect your data, right? There's so much to be considered, and all of these things that we're listing, you know, like um, uh, you know, user identity authentication, um, operational security, um, intrusion detection, uh, encryption of inter-services, um, hardware infrastructure, security on, on the boot stack, like all of this stuff, this comes out of the box when you move to the cloud. When you're on-prem, you're responsible for building all of this on your own, right? So, you know, one of our clients said, you know, if you look at like an AWS or a Google, um, you know, their security division is bigger than my entire IT department, probably bigger than my entire company, right? So what kind of egomaniacal maniac would I be to think that I can do better than they can do it, right? And that was a big justification internally for them to be able to make their, make their leap. Um, life is like riding a bicycle. If you keep your, uh, to keep your balance, you have to keep moving. I think in today's world where everything is digital, you're either moving forward or you're moving backward. There's no standing still. If you think you're standing still, you are drifting backward because everybody else around you is moving forward. And that, if you take anything away from this talk, hopefully that'll be it. If anybody wants to reach out to me directly, you can. Uh, Joe at Caserta.com or Joe underscore Caserta uh, on Twitter. Thank you very much. I could take a question or two if anybody wants. Any questions? Not a single question. Right here. Yeah, sorry. The scuba diver who knew the answer to your question. Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> Uh, just curious in terms of justification for going to the cloud for some of my clients who are reticent. Of the more popularized data breaches that we've heard about recently, how many of them were actually cloud-based versus on-prem? So most of them, I think the stat is over 80% are on-prem. There were a couple on the cloud. 
But um, more importantly, most of the data breaches that have happened, the big ones that we all know about, were actually through a third party. And that third party, which was a chatbot, um, was, had a vulnerability in it that allowed people to penetrate the infrastructure behind the, behind the firewall through the chatbot. So whether you're on the cloud or on-prem, you're never safe, right? You need to check the vulnerabilities of not only your own applications and databases, but also all of your partners involved as well. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much.